There's a pattern with meltdowns or various patterns. Sometimes there's a slow build up because of things like this. And sometimes when I'm working with parents, they'll say to me, Oh, he's going to have a meltdown on Friday. And it's only Wednesday. So how do you know? Well, I can see it. I can, they know the signs of the build-up. You go into schools and you get teachers say, oh, it'll happen about 3 o'clock on Friday evening. And it, it does. Because you can see the build-up through the week. But with other kids, it's not a build-up of these. These are always there under the surface. And sometimes with some kids, it's a little bit of extra sensory and it, it blows them, blows the mind. Does that make sense? It's one drop. And those are kids you say, oh, we haven't seen it coming. Yeah, one disappointment and it's one disappointment too many. So there's a, two different patterns where there's a build up over time and then there's an eruption type. But underneath all that, is a number of things that contribute to meltdowns. And one of the big ones is sensory. And we'll talk a little bit about sensory later. And then there's the being overstimulated in terms of your emotions. Not being able to regulate your feelings. Not being able to regulate your physical feelings and your emotional feelings. And then things like being overstimulated in terms of cognition. What do I mean by that? Too much going into the mind. And it's worth looking. How much pressure are we putting on our kids? Not as a deliberate act, but how much pressure are they under? How much information are they asked to take in? And how much can they actually take in? And I think that's worth exploring at school. And worth saying to schools, when you get anywhere, Lots of good schools you will, because they recognise this. They'll say, yeah, we only do little bits of teaching and we allow them to chill. Or we allow them to run around the playground or bounce something down. Because they realise there's to be a balance of what's going in. And there's, to be, there's got to be time <coughs> to process what's going in. And what happens sometimes, when you've all done this, do you sometimes wake up and your child's up and you think, it's a good day today? It's really doing what he's told. It's really easy to be with, just occasionally. And you know what we do? We pile everything into that day because we don't know how long that period is going to last. Have you done that? I think I'll nip to the dentist while he's in a good mood. Oh, and we'll stop at Tesco's while we're doing it. And, we'll, and schools do it. Let's do the national curriculum in two hours because he might not be in this mood to do that exam again or that again. And we don't realise sometimes that in order to be in what we call good mood, is managing all of that. And then we put extra on top of that, and suddenly they don't manage. So if, they, if they're doing really well, that's the time not to put extra on, but to build in gaps, and build in pleasurable things, so that you get more of the good times. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We often underestimate what that takes out of a person, managing that stimulation, uh, yeah, gaps. building gaps. What I mean by that is if it's been really great, uh, our, our response is, let's do more. Yeah. It's better to say, oh, you're fantastic today. Well, that's brilliant. Let's go and do this that's different, that gives his brain a rest. So like a bit of fun yeah, or meaningless. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the time for the fidget for some kids fidget toys. That's the time for other kids to do that big mathematical problem. You see, God, that can't be. But for their brain, that is rest. Is any of your kids like that? Different. I work with some people and their idea of chilling out is to do mathematical problems or work out a science problem. It's whatever chills and releases pressure for your child. It will be different. It's building that in. Maybe a room around the playground. There's a lot of evidence that building in vestibular, that is things like bouncing, uh, big balls, swings. It balances again. It helps entry putting every day to that overbuild. You see, the way we work is 
I could almost guarantee a good percentage of the things that wind me up, that overstimulate me, also all wind you up, you know, because we have that in common. Sometimes we haven't got that with the child with autism, so it's about of exploring. And it is different for different people. Uh, I work with someone called Steve, and we do conferences on sensory occasionally. And uh, I was doing my talk, introduction talk, and he signaled to me one day and said, I'm going. I'm thinking, no, you're not, you're due to keep talking a minute. But he went, and he came back later, and I said, why did you have to go? He said, I was feeling so sick, so dizzy. I said, why, you're not well? No, the carpet. And it's what I call hotel carpets. Do you know what I mean by yes, that? Yes. They tend to be gaudy colours yeah, and big swirls. And he said, I have motion sickness because of carpets. He also, it was double that day, because they got what I call my mum's wallpaper. You have to be so, you know, so they call flock. Yeah. 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 They said that and that. And he said, I couldn't hear you anymore. I couldn't concentrate. Mm -hmm. Totally overstimulated. And he just went out, deep breaths, came back in, and he was at a conference a few weeks after that, and he was giving a lecture. It was absolutely fantastic. I said, how you manage that, Steve? This is worse than the last place we're in. He said, yeah, but they've got chandeliers. I said, what? <laughs> he says, what I've done, while I'm lecturing, to manage the carpet, i counted how many individual droplets there are in all the chandeliers. I said, how many? He said, 7,000. I said, you've lectured while counting to 7,000? Yeah. He says, but I've managed the carpet by, ca by distracting myself. I said, well, not only talking at, you know, with tons of people is enough distraction, but not for Does that make sense? And looking at your child, it may be unusual things in the environment. And sometimes that overstimulation is what our response is, is done it for nothing. <laughs> in our world, <coughs> rental is good in terms of sponges on bodies, hands on body. In most people I know with autism, light touch, gentle touch is absolutely opposite, it's terrible because we are programmed to respond to the light touch in that our brain becomes alert because somebody touches me, I need to be alert, don't I, in case there's danger. Kids with autism, even more so. So we do things gently and that overstimulates the body and can cause pain. And it, it, have you heard of uh, Ross Blackburn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was at a conference we were doing about physical intervention with Ross Blackburn. And I'm saying minimum force, you know the law, if you, <laughs> minimum force. And she comes up and says, if you're going to hold me, get me on the floor and all of you jump on me. <laughs> I say, no, we can't. But she says, that's kinder. Because I need, I'm not saying hard force, but I need firmer. You can check that out, your kid's probably teaching you already. If they come and squeeze the life out of you some days, they're saying, that's what I need, Mum. Temple Dad. grounding. Temple grounding is the same. Yeah. 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 If you aren't familiar with Temple Grandin, brilliant engineer, she built her own squeeze machine for that reason. If you want to do the same and you can't afford three and a half thousand pounds, buy a heavy carpet. And I found for some kids who are getting a really heavy carpet, that at the times, you know, when there's too much light touch, when they need deep pressure, they can go under the carpet. So it's what, what I'm trying to say all of this, that sensory stimulation is dependent upon the individual, but we have to look and explore. And the more we look and explore, the more we're likely to manage that. And if we get in the habit of building in breaks, before the stimulation reaches an overflow stage. Does that make sense to people? And it's not a science. With all my experience in the world, sometimes I get it wrong, and I've waited too long before I put the brake in. You know, I've just thought, oh, it is going well. One more flick of the Argos catalogue ain't going to do that much harm, and it does for that child sometimes. So being overstimulated in those senses, the other thing that contributes to the meltdown is social skills difficulties. Very often, not having the social skills around the behaviour, not being able to manage interaction. 
not being able to manage relationships and the pressure that that brings. Uh, and for those who do manage it, the pressure that comes from managing it constantly, having to think about it wears you out, and sometimes that builds up. Uh, have you ever been in social situations where you felt out of your depth a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, been to a pop, probably you, I've got to posh back all the time. But you know, have <laughs> you ever gone to somewhere that's out of your depth a little bit? Mm -hmm. You've met people and you think, oh God, what am I doing here? I'm not mm -hmm. sure. And you come out absolutely worn out of those situations. You've been for inter anybody been for interview recently? Yeah. Where it's really mattered whether you get the job or that. Yeah? Having to, under, to be social, and be social in a different way to what you normally are, you come out and you want to go to bed. Does that make sense to most yeah. people? Yeah. Imagine your child with autism, it's almost like that all the time. Yeah. So, uh, Temple Grandin that someone mentioned, the, the woman with the squeeze machine, says her life is like performing on the stage all the time. And that's why she's tired, why she's stressed. Mm -hmm. You imagine, does any of you do drama and you do training, performing? It wears you out eventually. Yeah? And therefore, if you imagine your child is having to do, to learn and perform what everybody else is doing naturally. And that has to cause great pressure. When in school, be normal is what the message we put in, isn't it? But if you see the world, experience the world different, that costs you something. Something's got to give eventually, that's what we're talking about. Social school difficulties then. Can we look at the specifics, but even meeting, greeting people, even saying goodbye, that basic social skill, getting out of situations. People with autism, often the build-up comes for the able ones because they're in social situations too long because they don't know how to get out of it. Do you ever meet people in the out downtown? And they start to talk to you, and you like them, but there reaches a point where you think, I want to get out of this, I've had enough. You reach that, and you manage the pressure upon you from the social. How do you get out of those situations? When I first started in uh, special education, we spent a lot of time teaching kids social skills. There's no, there's no time to teach a lot of that now. I spent a lot of time walking around shopping centres practising social skills. You can't do that as much now. And therefore, we've got kids who don't know how to get out of the social situation, doesn't know how to release that pressure that comes from that, other than the autism ways of doing it. I think I've heard enough of you now, Jeff. I'm going. That was how I called Jonathan. Uh, he used to say that quite often. He now works for the Department of Pensions, by the way. And uh, it works quite well there, because he just said, oh, we finished the farm, that's enough, you can go now. And he used to do that all the time. People said, that's not appropriate. But it was hard to teach it, because that's the only thing he had. The behaviour side of things, I'm guessing some of your children escape the pressures of social by behaviour. I guarantee if somebody's putting a lot of pressure on you socially in, in school perhaps or at home, and you spit on them, it tends to work quite effectively, I believe, in social pressure. But it brings a load of other pressures. <laughs> but you're not thinking that as a person with rot. And you're thinking, if I spit, they go away. It's just like, if I say I'm busy, they go away. I think in the autistic brain there's no difference. It's only when you understand people that there's a difference between spitting and saying my dinner's cooking when it's not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have to teach kids how to manage all of this, but in terms of social, we have to give the social skills. And we have to then teach where you use them, when you use them, how you use them. Lack of structure, we've talked about a little bit, but not knowing what you're supposed to be doing. How long are you going to be doing it for? And the, the pressure that that brings. And I, I don't know if I've talked about it before, but if there's no structure, children, en children engage in behaviours that we call challenging, and I call them ending behaviours. Situation factors that contribute to meltdown. Coping with the unexpected. How I many of you find that a little bit difficult? But you're able to predict 
So not even the unexpected is not quite as unexpected as it is for your child. Because you think about, well, I had something similar to that before, and I can therefore understand even new things. Unpredictable, rightness is missing, the unfamiliar, interruptions of rituals and routines. I get a bit worried when I hear advice like, well, you shouldn't let him. You know, the kid who puts his underpants on 22 times. And people say, well, make him put it on once, that's what I do. And then wonder why the kid blows. Because, back to the iceberg, 21 times is for the reason, from his point of view. If we stop that without addressing the reason, then we're going to see meltdown. Health factors, don't want to go too much into these, but you know what you like when you're unwell. But there's different health factors for kids with autism. Too much, for some kids, too much sugar. Uh, it's in the news all the time at the moment, isn't it, about the dangers of sugar. We've known that with kids with autism for years. But naturally occurring sugars can give a boost to the system and lead to meltdown. Natural occurring sugars that are appear in apples, bananas, strawberries, those types of things. Not for every kid, but for some kids. If your kid obsessively eats apples, bananas, pears, that type of thing, it could be that they almost crave from that. And we need to think about managing that. Don't take it away, get help from uh, some expert in that area. But health factors in terms of uh, foods, drinks, uh, I used to work with a lad, if you had two mouthfuls of uh, Coca-Cola, it was equivalent to an old bottle of whiskey. When money was scarce, I used to envy him. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper, isn't it? But he'd, he'd be on the floor literally, feet in the air. Any of your children like that? I mean, not that extreme, but it can contribute. It can be a good thing, by the way, that. Uh, I was working with a, ma a young man last year, a young teenage boy, who had been in closed down for about four years. Absolute brilliant kid. And goes into closed down this time of year because the light is too light. You know what it means if you look out today? He can't manage it sensory, so he cuts off. And when I want him to get things done with him, important things, I was giving him a diet of coke because having extra caffeine just brought him up to the same level as everybody else almost. But uh, So you can use things positively. Over and under demands made upon the individual. Lack of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. If you feel crap about yourself, you behave in crap ways, put simply. And a lot of times people with autism feel bad about themselves because we don't. And this isn't a criticism of parents at all. It's a criticism of the system that we don't reinforce what is good about autism enough, what is good about the person with autism. The curriculums we're forced into. And I, I was listening to the news this morning. Thank goodness a group of teachers, I think it's some new union, to say, please give us control of the curriculum because we know what kids need to learn. And I thought if that happens, that's going to make a big difference to kids with autism. Some, some if, feel. If it's managed, then that is the driver. Temple Grand in obsession with cows and pigs. You know, if you did an assessment of that, you'd say not going very far in life at age seven, mm -hmm. only interest cows and pigs. But she's the one of the top uh, scientists in the world now in terms of animal husbandry. Bill Gates, mm -hmm. rather obsessed with mathematics and computers. Uh, Einstein, where it's channeled, but where that isn't recognised and celebrated, then it becomes a contributor to difficult behaviour. And I think in simplistic terms, what the child does is say, look, I'm giving you my best. Pokemon world expert, and you don't appreciate it at all, <laughs> tell me to do something else. Can you see from now that can build up over your life? I need to, you know, I pick Pokemon because people say, oh, well, how can you? Daniel, I, I haven't seen him for about five years, but uh, last time I saw him, he was making a good living. He never went out of his bedroom on the internet, ordering Pokemon and selling Pokemon and whatever's in now. It makes as much money as some of you will out of that. And that, more than the money, he's got self-esteem because people email him. 
Danny, where do you get this? What's the best poker? And what? Can you see how that's changed? And he doesn't go out, and there's great pressure. Oh, he should be social. Why should he, if he's getting all his needs met and feeling good about himself at all? So if you can turn it around. I sometimes mention the best school, I think the best school in the world, I'm slightly biased, but when I go into that school, they celebrate every child. And you walk in, and there's a lad meets you, or a girl, but it's a little lad at mum, and he shakes your hand and says, I'm the school official greeter. Now in other schools, people in he's a nosy one. Go and sit down and get on with your work. In this school, celebrate. Official photographer. He takes your badge photo, you know, for the security in the school. He's got status. Official chair sorter. Oh, wait, I can't remember the exact word they use, it's better than that. He's the obsessive kid who can't stand chairs being out of place. <laughs> and therefore, in many schools, they keep him away from the chairs. There, they programmed it into his day, where he walks around school and just makes sure everything's okay. Yeah, it's genius, but common sense, isn't it? Yeah. The kid who can't stand windows to be open. He stays 10 minutes after all the other children have gone and he does a safety check with the caretaker and he gets a little present at the end of every Friday for his extra work and contribution to the school safety. Can you imagine how those kids feel in terms of self-esteem? They've all got the photos on the walls and this is their special. And other places you go and all of those things are seen as problems so they become problems. And we all do that, don't we? But it's finding what you're good at. And it is a lifelong problem, I think. And certainly the people who are, are successful in autism and the people who are happy are the ones who are engaging in what makes them happy. That sounds a little bit common sense. Things are changing. I'll just mention this. And I think it's worth mentioning to most of you who've got children with autism. Things are changing in the world, and maybe for your child. Uh, Peter Valmoren is working on an assessment at the moment that uh, assesses well-being and happiness. And so you can measure if a school contributes, if a home contributes to the child's happiness and well-being. And uh, but what you said, I think, is an important message. Uh, I was speaking last night in Harlow, and a mum came and said, my child's just been diagnosed, and I've just sat and you're talking about being positive, she said, and I've just realised that all I've been doing is managing problems and not managing and developing all the good things about my five-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. And she said, I feel terrible. I said, not feel terrible, I feel great that the pennies drop. So I work with people at 60 who's just realising that because of the kind of society. Anxieties and worries, transition difficulties, lack of coping skills, all those things there. Difficulties understanding others contribute. You are mystery some days to your child. Mystery is sensory overload. Some of the things you say are confusing, not because you do it deliberately, because that's how we use language. See, it is, a lot of this is difficult to teach to your audience, because we learn it intuitively. It's there almost, isn't it? I must, those who were in my first session, I can't remember if I said this to you, but a friend of mine tells a story of a boy in Birmingham, a uh, 14-year-old, very bright lad, and he's starting to get interested in girls at the moment, and his dad's giving him tips. And, it, and dads aren't always the best people to give tips, but he's giving him tips. And uh, he said, look, women like to be flattered. I'm not saying I agree with this, but that's what my dad said. Women like to be flattered. So he says, let's practice with your mum. Next time she's going out, when she comes downstairs to go out with her mates, uh, I want you to look at her and tell how beautiful she looks. And so mum comes downstairs to go out on the town with her mates, and the boy looks, and dad kicks his ankle, you know, to prompt him. And uh, he says, mum, you look absolutely beautiful. And dad thinks, crafty. Mum, you look absolutely beautiful, just like a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> and you can teach, but you can't give the context and the interest. And what was he missing? Contextual understanding. Why did he say that? At the time, there was a programme 
uh, a series about prostitutes in Birmingham or in Manchester. I forgot what it was called. Band of Gold. Band of Gold. He looked at his mum. I'm guessing she'd got all the makeup <laughs> things. And the only reference he'd got was one of the women there. <laughs> because he didn't understand. And we do. We teach all this. And what's that to do with meltdown? It's this. Can you imagine what it's like? Where day after day you're doing your best to conform. I'm not saying your kids always do, by the way. And you're doing your best to learn all these skills. And you're doing the best to manage all these behaviours. And it still doesn't work a lot of the time. And that, I think, is part of the country. When you talk to people like Cornish and that, that's what happened at school. A young man called Tom who works with me. In and out of mainstream school, more out than in. And he said, I never really knew what I was doing wrong, Jeff. I thought I was pleasing people. I thought if I talked to them about my favourite thing, it would be their favourite thing. If I invited children to play with me in the playground, they would all be queuing up to play sharp. And obviously most eight-year-olds have to clue who sharp was and didn't understand the rules of Napoleonic War games. <laughs> and he said, I could never understand why I weren't popular because I was doing my best. And he had massive meltdown because of that pressure of continually managing things. We're going to look at strategies and look at a model for looking at meltdowns after the break.